In the third part of our tutorial series, we will gradually increase the complexity of our locking setup. First, we will apply top of fringe locking to a Doppler free signal using the lock in module. In the second step, we will use both PID modules for a two branch feedback loop, where one branch is assigned to low frequency noise, whereas the other branch is dedicated to the higher frequency components. To follow this tutorial, you should already be familiar with the graphical user interface and the auto lock feature of the Digilock. You should also have an understanding of the working principles of a lock-in regulator. Let us quickly recapitulate the system setup. A DL Pro laser is fiber connected to a Doppler-free cesium spectroscopy setup. The Doppler-free absorption signal from a compact spectroscopy, COSI, is fed into the main Digilog input. Additionally, the Doppler broaden signal is fed into the auxiliary input. The Digilog is connected to a scan control unit via an internal backplane connection in a DC 110 supply rack. The scan control will act only as a voltage amplifier to supply the PCT inside the laser head. First, we have to change from a Doppler broaden spectrum to a Doppler free spectrum. The COSI conveniently provides both on different output connectors. So all I need to do is change the visibility of both input signals. I hide the auxiliary and unhide main in. The next step is to derive an error signal that allows me to do top of fringe locking. There are two modules for achieving this, namely the lock-in module and the pound driver hall module. Throughout this tutorial, we will use the lock-in module. To obtain a derivative of our spectroscopy signal, the laser frequency has to be modulated with a sinusoidal signal generated within the lock-in module. In a similar fashion to the scan and offset modules, the modulation can be directed to various targets. In our setup, the only connection between Digilog and the laser is the PCT via the scan control, so my only option right now is the scan control. The grating mount has its first acoustic resonance at about 4 kHz, so I will have to stay well below that. 2 kHz is a reasonable number. I will start with a low value of 0 0.01 volts for the amplitude. And then activate the modulation. We notice almost no effect on the signal shape, so let's increase the modulation amplitude to a value of 0 0.05 volts. Now we can actually notice a difference, so we know that the modulation arrives at the PCT. I now reduce the amplitude again. Later on, we will see if it's sufficient to generate a signal from the lock-in. Let us briefly switch the modulation off again, so we can define the input signal for the lock-in. This is the signal with which the original modulation will be mixed. Since we want to lock to the Doppler-free line, I choose main input. I will leave the relative phase at a default value of 0. We will optimize it a bit later. I now configure channel 2 of the oscilloscope. We do not need a Doppler broaden spectrum from the auxiliary input. Instead, I will choose the lock in output, LI out, and unhide channel 2. We can now see both the modulated spectroscopy signal and also the derivative onto which we are going to lock. The signal is still not clear though. I can improve this by reducing the scan rate to 2.5 Hz in order to allow for more precise sampling and adjusting the timescale on the oscilloscope accordingly. Let me quickly redefine the scale on the y-axis in order to separate the two traces. 
the derivative signal is still a bit noisy for a modulation amplitude of 0 0.01 volt, so I carefully increase it. Next, we need to virtually rewire our PID. We change from auxiliary in to lock in out. Since I'm going to auto lock, I define the input signal there. Again, we make sure that only PID is enabled for now. Then we quickly check that the output of PID2 is still set correctly to the scan control. In order to avoid overdriving the feedback loop in the beginning, I will again start with very moderate settings for the overall gain and the eye contribution. For the final adjustments, let us switch to autolock display. You will notice that on the y-axis two signals are now displayed. The digilock will always display the signal that we are going to lock to, in this case LI out. In addition, for top of fringe locking, it will also display the signal that is fed into the lock-in, in this case main in. This is reflected by the fact that both channels are relabeled to spectrum and input. The trace cursor can be set to either of them. I choose Spectrum. Once we are in auto lock mode, the adjust button for the lock-in phase is no longer grayed out and I can now run an automatic optimization for best lock-in signal. In order to see the difference, I will disable the auto scale feature for the lock-in out signal. Now we zoom further onto one hyperfine transition by using the hand tool and the zoom tool. Finally, I drag the crosshair to the peak and right click. We see now that the previous option, PID lock to slope, is grayed out. Instead, the option lock to extremum is available. So, let us go ahead. And done. I could now go ahead and further optimize the locking parameters. In the second part of this tutorial, we will enhance our lock setup a bit. To enhance the bandwidth of our lock, we need to modulate the laser faster. The safest way to achieve this is by using the mod DC current modulation input of the DL Pro, which we connect to the main output of the DigiLock. Now we can control the laser wavelength with both piezo and laser current. So we can design an advanced feedback loop where the low frequency components of the error signal can be fed to the PCT, while the high frequency components will be directed to the mod DC. So let us translate that setup into our user interface. In the auto lock tab of the PID, I will now enable PID1 and PID2. PID1 has not been used yet, so we need to configure it. First, we will again set moderate locking parameters of 5 and 1 for overall gain and I. Since PID1 will be the fast branch, we set the output to main out, which is connected to the current modulation. There is an important checkbox to the right, named I cut off. This limits the integral part of PID1 and is important in case of PID1 is used together with PID2, because it prevents the controllers from accumulating offsets in opposite directions. I will leave the cutoff frequency at the suggested 100Hz. Next, we will change our lock-in. I have already switched it off and can lastly direct the output to main out. This allows for larger modulation frequencies up to 780 kHz. Now switch the modulation back on again and re-optimize the phase.
As you see, thanks to the higher modulation frequency, we can obtain a nice error signal at scan rates of 10 Hz. We are already set for another attempt. We are still in auto lock mode, so we just zoom onto one of the hyperfine peaks, drag the cursor to its top, and lock. This wraps up our tutorial series. I hope you will enjoy working with your Digilog and let us know what you think about it.